Kemi Baderock, thank you so much for sitting down with me. Now, it was very much the government's intention to remove all 4,000 bits of EU legislation from the British statute book. We have, after all, left the EU. You announced yesterday that actually, in total, you're only removing around 2,000 by the end of this year. That's only 50%. Mm. Why the delay? Why the U-turn? Uh, there, there is no delay. And well, there, there is, is on the original target, which was all of it. The, well, I, well, I would dispute that. We found 4,000 pieces of EU legislation, and what we're doing is re making them uh, the ones that we want to keep UK legislation. So in getting rid of EU legislation, we turn them into UK legislation. But during that process, we remove the ones that we don't think are necessary, and we reform and improve the ones that we think can be reformed and improved. And I think it's one of those uh, things where you know you campaign in poetry and govern in prose. Actually, legislative uh, processes such as this are quite complicated and technical. And when I took on the responsibility, I looked at the best way for us to focus on what the real benefits of leaving the EU are, which is the regulatory reform, not just saying there's no EU law here, it's how we can make things better for our business and our competitive environment. And that's really what is going to help drive economic growth, which is what my department is all about. You campaign in poetry and govern in prose. Are you telling me, Minister, you're quite happy to junk all your election promises and do what is actually practical rather than what you promised the British voters? No, not at all. We are keeping our promises. But what I am saying is that how you describe something simply and succinctly in a campaign does not explain the long-running complex and technical process of legislative reform. It actually just takes quite a long time. It needs a lot of people and it needs a lot of care. I'm an engineer by background. I did a lot of software coding in my uh, previous career. Mm -hmm. And I, know, I, also, I also, as you will know, Tom, have a law degree. You don't just delete things from the statute book. Well, yes, you when do we if you promise to do that. Yes, That's the yes, point. Uh, yes, and there are some things which we have got rid of. We, like I said, we've got uh, about 2,000 which will go in total. There are some things which you remove, some things which you keep, sometimes because they were actually our ideas in the first place, and other things which you reform. But simply pressing a button and pretending we're deleting our Word documents is not how this sort of process happens. And what I'm trying to do is make sure that business has the confidence and the certainty that we're uh, taking great care and being rigorous in carrying out the process of regulatory reform now that we've left the EU. And I won't apologize for that. We are keeping our promises, but we're doing our job properly. Of these 4,000 bits of legislation, quite a few of them are still going to hang around forever. Well, which ones would you like to remove? Well, you're the one, you're the government that says you want to remove them all. Well, if you're now saying you want to keep half of them, so, that's great. I just asked uh, the question. Well, this is what I'm saying, that you're misinterpreting what it is we're trying to do. Uh, we I are trying... listen to the last business secretary, it's, it's, Jacob Rees-Mogg, who promised to, to as you well, say, I, I, delete a lot of them. I'm, I'm not Jacob Rees-Mogg, and this is a different prime minister. We are not rushing through just to delete things from the statute book. We are looking at regulation carefully and making sure that we remove what we uh, feel is unnecessary, but we reform and improve what we can. And I'm not, I'm not going to apologize for that, but I also won't be represented as U-turning. That's not what's happening. We are removing the laws that we wanted to remove. There was never uh, any sense that we were going to remove things like product, uh, you know, product safety, some of the good things around environmental standards, which we wanted, and actually we've gone further than. Okay. What we said is that we're removing EU supremacy. We're removing the supremacy of EU law from our statute book. The laws that we want to keep are now UK laws, and that's how we're getting rid of the 4,000. There is not going to be anything where we have to look to the EU to ask for permission or to ask for guidance okay. on. As you know, some of this delay, U-turn, whatever language mm -hmm. you, you want to use, change, practical change in government mm -hmm. policy, has infuriated quite a few Tory MPs mm -hmm. on, on the right of the party, Brexiteers. One of them said this to the Daily Telegraph, you need a tough minister, but Kemi is a lame minister <laughs> who's having rings run around her by Remainer officials. Yeah, I, I actually laughed out loud when, when, um, when I read that. There are a lot of people who talk but can't do. I went in there. I spent quite a few months going through the detail. I asked uh, uh, MPs who had been in that meeting what they wanted to remove, and they couldn't say anything. And I think that is uh, more illustrative of the problem we have, that there are too many people who spend a lot of time talking I need to do the thinking and the doing. So, You're talking about Tory MPs um, who talk I'm, I'm but can't talking, do. I'm, I'm talking, there are many people across Parliament in the media and in the commentariat who make a lot of noise, but they're not the ones who have to do the doing. I trust the officials I'm working with. I do feel that they need direction and guidance. And actually, we need to stop 
turning uh, the process of reform into one where we're laboriously trying to preserve uh, EU legislation, which is what's happening. What I've done is change the approach. And I think that it's the right thing uh, for the legislative programme that we have and for the country. Let's talk about your equalities brief, because that is one of your responsibilities as well. Uh, Florida's governor, Ron DeSantis, also a presidential candidate, he met you a couple of weeks ago when he was over here. Uh, he seemed to rather like you. <laughs> yes, he did. We got on well. Uh, well, look, he said this about you. He hailed your fight against the woke culture. He complimented your efforts to stop it all, uh, to which he said was a corrupting British society. Do you think he's right? Is the woke movement corrupting British society? Uh, you know, I don't like using the work, word woke because I think it trivialises uh, quite a lot of stuff that is very serious. But we did agree that much of what uh, is in the UK that we do dislike originated from, from the US, which is where that, that statement came from. But actually, we both felt that there are many people who don't necessarily take pride in their country anymore, and they have become fixated with historical issues that happened long before any of us were around, which we can't do anything about, and almost uh, believe that the very inheritance that the countries have is undeserved and unpick it in, in all sorts of ways. Call it woke, call it the culture wars. Mm. We're talking about the same thing here. Keir Starmer brought it up this week. Mm. Uh, he told his shadow cabinet, he said this, uh, the NHS trumps woke every day of the week. He's basically said, you're obsessed with woke, you're obsessed with the culture wars. He's right that voters care more about the NHS than any of this stuff, isn't he? Um, voters care about a lot of things. It depends on what is particularly uh, affecting them at, uh, uh, at any moment. But this is not something that I actually spend quite a lot of time talking about. So what is interesting is that lots of other people bring it up. I don't ask him what is a woman. I'm not the one who's been chasing him around. And uh, you know maybe someday he'll be able to have an answer to that. But it does have an impact on both things. If you cannot define what a woman is, how are you going to provide health care properly to people? And one of the things that I do see in the, um, in the NHS is lots of complaints about people being missed, because their sex is recorded improperly. We have a duty to make sure the data is accurate and that we are being clear about who uh, is getting treatment, what kind of facilities they need. We have a women's health strategy that is very, very important in order to deliver for women in this country. And so we do focus on those issues. OK, uh, finally, let's talk about last week's local election results. I mean, they were disastrous for the Conservative Party. You lost over 1,000 council seats, far worse than your worst expectations and your expectation management. The idea from the Prime Minister, perhaps, or, or the government that, you know, we're no longer a shambles is enough to win you elections. It, it just didn't seem to be enough from last week. Do you think you need to offer the voters a bit more than just managerialism? Well, the Prime Minister has five priorities that I don't think are managerialism. He wants to halve inflation, uh, stopping the small boats, a new problem that is actually affecting all of Europe, as is inflation, reducing our debt, uh, growing the economy. That's not man managerialism. And um, uh, NHS waiting list, you talked about the NHS. Those are people's priorities. And what we're doing is delivering on people's priorities. At some stage, are you going to have to offer something more than those five promises? Something for the future, some hope, something a bit bigger, a bit more ambitious? I am absolutely certain that the Prime Minister will do that. But actually, what he's keen to show is that we are getting on with the job. Uh, and many uh, of the issues we had last year just around the general political turbulence are behind us. It's a, uh, it's a natural thing that occurs in politics, but we need to show not just the people in this country, but the rest of the world, as I do with my international partners, that we are open for business and we're doing very well. You're currently the bookie's favourite to succeed Rishi Sunak as leader of the Conservative Party. Is that a title you're comfortable to wear? Not really, no. There is... A it's, it's one of the consequences of throwing your hat into the ring uh, at the last minute. But actually, one of the best things about doing so is that I can do this job, which actually gives me a lot of the levers to do the things that I talked about last summer, about driving economic growth. All right. Well, as you make the point, you did indeed run for the Tory leadership last year to be the Prime Minister. Are you saying you've given up your ambition to lead the party one day? What I'm saying is that I'm very focused on being business and trade secretary. I'm fully supportive That's of the not Prime a Minister. No I think he's doing I think secretary. he's doing a great job. If you had asked if you had asked me in January last year, would you run for Prime Minister? I'd have said no. Things change. Uh, and and I ended up doing that. I would not have foreseen any of the circumstances that meant that could happen. And it could happen the other way, where I say yes and actually decide not to do it. So what I do is say nothing, because I, I don't tell lies, and I don't want to say anything that actually will depend on the state of mind I'm in in the future. I'm fo only focused now 
on doing business and trade. Can we obey not? And equalities. <laughs> Well, I'm remembering that bit. Uh, <laughs> Kerry Baylor, thanks so much for talking to me. Thank you. Thank you, Tom.